deep endometriosis infiltrating the left ovarian fossa, left ureter, left right uterosacral ligament and the roof of the retrovaginal septum. This represents part two of our progressive learning section on how to resect deep endometriotic nodules. Deep endometriosis is probably the most challenging area of laparoscopic surgery. It is difficult to diagnose preoperatively, like in this case, and also difficult to manage when unexpectedly discovered during surgery. Most surgeons decide to simply cauterize the lesions and stop there. We know that when lesions invade more than 5 mm in depth, the peritoneum, superficial burning simply leaves the lesions intact, as well as the accompanying symptoms. Deep endometriotic nodules can be found in various places and organs more frequently, affecting bowel wall, ureter and bladder. We are going to present a series of videos demonstrating our technique on how to resect such nodules. For this purpose we have selected specific cases starting from simpler cases and advancing to more complex in a stepwise progression. Before we start I shall stress the following points. Endometriosis surgery in general and deep endometriosis in particular is a bloody and dangerous business. Thus one has to use correct techniques and principles of hemostasis by applying electricity fundamentals as in our surgery in an efficient but safe fashion. Overuse of diathermy can cause unwanted burns with adverse consequences. Underuse or no use of hemostasis will result in a bloody field with loss of anatomical detail, which is vital for the safe resection of deep nodules. We never tackle the problem from within the lesion. Whether we divide adhesions or resect nodules, we always start from a healthy area and encompass the problem. This has two benefits. First, you start from normal anatomy where it's easier to recognize structures and secondly, you have less bleeding. As you progress, you leave the resection of lesion at the end when it's easier to resect it completely. Do not rush. Take your time and study the problem. Discuss your tactics with your colleagues and work together. Involve your assistants and make them part of your operation. Finally, when you start, always collaborate with a more experienced surgeon. Remember, a complication managed intraoperatively correctly is not a complication. A 32-year-old mother of one child, six years old, with severe dysmenorrhea who was diagnosed with deep endometriosis. Pre-op investigations. Vaginal examination showed a thickened and tender left uterosacral ligament as well as an induration of the rectovaginal septum. Vaginal ultrasound showed normal ovaries with a retroverted uterus and fibrosis of the septum. The uterus showed adenomyosis of the posterior fundal wall. Ureters appeared normal, blood tests all within normal range. The situation was discussed with the patient and she consented for a diagnostic operative laparoscopic procedure to remove pelvic endometriosis. After introducing the laparoscope, the whole of the abdomen was carefully examined. There was a significant amount of free blood in the pelvis due to retrograde bleeding from a recent menstruation. In this case, this was probably one of the predisposing factors for her peritoneal endometriosis. However, it could not justify the deeper endometriotic deposits nor her uterine adenomyosis. After inspection, the whole of the abdomen and the pelvis in particular were meticulously washed with normal saline. The uterus was firmly fixed in a retroverted position due to the dense fibrous adhesions between the left pelvic sidewall and the posterior aspect of the uterus.
With the use of the cannula tip, the adhesions were gently broken and uterus as well as the left ovary lifted from the peritoneum. The peritoneal surface was further rinsed and cleaned with normal saline. Sigmoid adhesions were divided and the peritoneum opened intentionally to identify the left ureter as it entered the pelvis. The ureter was dissected free whilst paying attention not to damage its vascular area. The left ovary was lifted and transfixed against the abdominal wall with a 2.0 monocryl suture on a straight needle. The ureter was further dissected to the level of the left uterine artery. The dissection was assisted with a strong grasping forceps that pulled the fibrotic peritoneum away from the ureter.
Pay attention to the careful use of hemostasis during dissection. By doing so, the retroperitoneal anatomy, such as the hypogastric nerves, is clearer assessed and respected. The fibrous tissue was entirely resected down to the level of healthy anatomy. The left uterosacral ligament was transected. The peritoneal resection continued behind the cervix and across to the opposite side. The rectal vaginal septum was opened and the rectal wall identified.
Once the whole of the fibrotic tissue was surrounded and cut, the underlying tissues were freed. Wash and clean all surfaces and check hemostasis. The rectal wall was assessed by carrying out a narrow leak test whilst blocking the sigmoid with an atraumatic forceps. The pelvic cavity was washed again and all surfaces inspected. Conclusive thoughts. This video takes your surgery to the next difficulty level. In this case, the ureter as well as the rectum were carefully dissected free of endometriosis. However, the same principles applied like in the previous case. Thus, the operation started from the healthy area and progressed towards the pathological. The anatomy needs always to be identified and delicate structures moved out of harm's way by careful dissection. Pelvic nerves, when possible, identified and spared. Bipolar diathermy should be used, but be careful not to inadvertently touch the wrong structures. Stray currents can happen, thus always check the isolation coats of your instruments. Like we did with our previous case, where the bladder wall was checked, we did the same here with the rectum. In the next video we shall demonstrate an endometriotic nodule affecting the rectal wall.